Good afternoon, everybody. Hope you're enjoying the sunshine, using plenty of sunblock out there. It's uh, something we're not used to seeing all this sun out there, but uh, nice to have with us, makes a pleasant change. Uh, always pleased to welcome back Jonathan Bergwer. Jonathan is a regular contributor to SAGE, uh, and we know that we're going to have a very interesting and informative afternoon session from him. This afternoon's talk, his title is Josephus. Um, Josephus was the first century priest, politician, soldier, and writer who deserted the Jewish cause, rejected its leaders as zealots, and became the first Jewish historian. Jonathan asks, was he a traitor to the Jewish cause or a hero of moder moderation? Our decision by the end of his talk. Jonathan, over to you. Oh, thank you very much, Stuart. And thank you also for inviting me here again today. Um, the character we're going to be talking about, Josephus, is, is very different to any of the other ones that I've talked about. Very controversial figure. Um, so, as Stuart mentioned, he was a Jew who initially fought against the Romans on the Jewish side, but then went over to them. And did he do this for patriotic reasons, as he claimed, or was he a traitor? So, as usual, I'm going to be talking about his life and also his books. And towards the end, I'll show you a video about Masada, which is the picture in the background I've got here. He's the one that brought this to the fore. Um, I'm aware that unlike some of the other characters that we've talked about, some of the history surrounding him um, you may not all know about. So please feel free to uh, send a text or, or put your hand up if you wish to ask a question as we're going along. And I'd be happy to answer that. Um, I should also say that the only information that we have about Josephus comes from himself. So he wrote a whole series of books which were not really history, they're spin. He put himself in a very positive light. He wanted to describe himself for posterity in a certain way. So it's a bit of my mysterious to work out what really was him and just what is it that he is trying to portray. Anyway, I'll give the best history that we actually have about him. So Titus Flavius Josephus, to give him his Roman name, was actually born Joseph ben Matitahu in about 37 or 38 of the Common Era. He was born in Jerusalem to a highly respectable family, the second son of Matitius. His mother was actually descended from royalty, from the Hasmonean dynasty. So the family were wealthy, they were Jewishly observant, they were part of the cosmopolitan elite of Jerusalem at the time. Um, and, and they generally accepted uh, Roman power. So he was raised in Jerusalem, educated with his elder brother Matthias to be a priest. And his father was the one that gave him his education. He was precocious and in his youth, he says he was well, he was renowned for his knowledge of Torah. And that priests and leading men consulted him on halakha. We do know that he spoke Aramaic, Hebrew and Greek. From the age of 16, he spent three years with a guy called Banus, who was an ascete, um, an Essene. Uh, uh, someone who lived in the desert, a bit like John the Baptist, to use some an, another analogy. So uh, apparently during this time, he wore clothes made of reeds. He lived on wild herbs. He washed in the river in the morning and the evening. And after that, he returned to Jerusalem and served as a priest. By now, he says he has a deep knowledge of Bible and he didn't receive any further formal education. He gradually established himself amongst the Jerusalem hierarchy. And then age 26, he traveled to Rome to negotiate the release of some Jewish priests who had been arrested by the Romans. Now en route to Rome, obviously by the Mediterranean, by sea, he was shipwrecked. And he claims that he swam all night to safety in a sort of miraculous thing, a bit like Jonah, I suppose you could argue as well. 
In Rome, he was introduced to the emperor, someone called Poppea Sabina, by uh, a well-connected Jewish actor called Alitorius. Josephus got the priests released, and Poppea, the empress, gave him presents. So his reputation in Rome as a mediator increased. Um, he, he, in return, was very impressed with Rome, and he spent two years there. So it's now about 66 in the Common Era, and this is when he returns to Judea, the, 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 the Roman province. And by this start time, it's in complete anarchy. He, Josephus, criticizes the Roman procurator. The procurator is the guy who's in control of it. Um, uh, and this, th at this time, it was called Gassius Florus was the name of the procurator. Now, he was not a good guy. None of the procurators were good guys. This one was particularly insensitive. And he had provocatively raided the temple treasury and deliberately incensed Jews. So a Jewish priestly group rose to the bait and they inflamed the situation further as they stopped making the daily sacrifices in the temple in honor of Caesar. So this was kind of a rebellious thing. It was a bit like not paying your taxes. Josephus always maintained that it was Florus, the Roman, who had forced the Jews to make war on Rome. And this is a quote from his book. It was Florus who gave us no option other than to fight the Romans, as we thought that it would be better to be destroyed at once instead of little by little. There was a despotic Roman control over the country for sure, but the Jews were kind of not many Jews were not that keen to cooperate as well. So the Jews at this point were led by a group of elders which were called the Sanhedrin. Uh, this is a, a, a priestly group, 70 could be of, of rabbinic leaders, and they were the effective war cabinet of the Jews. And what they did is they divided the country of Judea into seven districts, and Josephus was appointed military governor of Galilee. And this was the most important assignment in the first phase of the war. His arrival there was fraught with internal division. The locals resented being told what to do by a Jerusalem priest who was only 28 and who had no experience of guerrilla warfare or any affinity with the fighters. The Galilee was known for being an area where the common people came from. Um, I come from the north, so I can say this. It's a bit like how southerners think of the north today. And they, and, and they thought of him like some northerners think of southerners as well. Now, he probably had some secret instructions. And his instructions were to protect the local patricians, the elite, and to build up a power base and then to negotiate peace with the Romans. The Sanhedrin didn't really want war um, and they, because they didn't want the social upheaval this would involve. And also the, the Jews were bound to lose. If they were a small group. How could you take on a massive empire? However, after a while, it became clear that hostilities were inevitable. So then he got his act together and he genuinely organized the defense of the Galilee. He fortified several towns, but he couldn't get them to act together. And the defences proved useless. And in the process, he antagonised many inhabitants. He comes across as quite arrogant and know-it-all. And he failed to control the local forces. So, in fact, some towns, such as Sepphoris and Tiberias, you might know of today, they opted to sue for peace with the Romans and they opposed Josephus. And he particularly became an enemy of a local leader called John of Giscala, who he describes as, quote, the most cunning and unscrupulous of all the men who have ever gained notoriety by evil means. This guy, John, tried to kill him on a number of occasions. He spread rumours that he was a traitor, tried to overthrow him. John's important as he's going to later become the zealot leader in Jerusalem. 
The Sanhedrin, the military commanders of the Jews, they thought Josephus was incompetent by now, and they tried to remove him. But he schemed and he clung on to power. He was humiliated by his treatment, but he stuck in there. He tried to fight the Romans, uh, but he had too few men and the locals didn't support him. And at this point, the Roman army under uh, Vespasian, who's later going to become emperor, and his son Titus, who was also going to become emperor and is going to have the arch in Rome about him, they were advancing and Josephus and his forces ran away. Um, he eventually threw his lot in in a town called Yotapata, or Yotvat as it's now called. And he thought he could stay there because this was strongly uh, defensively uh, appropriate. You could defend it geographically because it was in a ravine, basically. It may well have had some chance of surviving a siege, but the forces were far too big. And then when he realized that the city couldn't hold out much longer and his life was in danger, he made plans to escape with other local leaders. And at this point, a large mob gathered and begged him not to abandon them. So he stays. Eventually, the town falls to an overwhelming Roman army after a 47 day siege. Now, many inhabitants were either killed or they committed suicide once they were captured. Josephus escapes to a cave by jumping into a deep pit. And in there are 40 other notables, leaders. This is all in Josephus's words, by the way. So you have to take it maybe as truth, maybe as a story. Uh, but it's an interesting story, as I'll come to later at the, when I talk about Masada. So anyway, the Romans found out where he was hiding and demanded his surrender. And he wrote about these events later in the third person. So describing him, himself, he says, Suddenly he remembered the dreams he had sometimes dreamed at night when God showed him the future calamities that were going to strike the Jews, as well as what would happen to the Roman emperors. So he's saying he's a prophet, a biblical prophet at this point. Joseph says he wants to surrender, but the other 40 Jews in the cave wouldn't permit it. Instead, they thought he should join them in a mass suicide, as this was the only on honourable course to take. But as suicide was prohibited in Jewish law, as you know, Josephus proposed instead that each man should kill his neighbour. The order of this being determined by drawing lots. A bit like the story of, um, uh, of, of Haman and the lots. Fortuitously, he survived until the very last lot was about to be drawn. So there was just a pair of them left. At this point, Josephus persuades the other guy to surrender to the Romans. He claimed this was both the moral course to take and the will of God. Her heroism in battle was justified, but future self-sacrifice after defeat was not. Um, and he later claims he's commanded to act like a prophet. He says, I'm not going over to the Romans and I'm certainly not a traitor. I do this because I am God's servant. Um, and in fact, he, he thinks that the revelation that he receives at this time has taught him three things. That God had decided to punish the Jews. That fortune had been given to the Romans and that God had chosen him to be the prophet. So for Josephus, Rome was simply assigned by God as the latest group of people to torment the Jews. And the Jews deserve this because of their repeated transgressions. So this is the classic story we get in the Bible all the time. So he was, he surrendered and Vespasian captures him. And Vespasian's a vain guy and ambitious. So Josephus prophesizes to, Ves uh, to Vespasian that he, Vespasian, is the subject of a well-known Jewish uh, pro a messianic belief 
that the master of the world, in inverted commas, would come from Judea, and this referred to Vespasian becoming emperor of Rome. The same thing was used by Jesus, the previous generation. So he says, Josephus says, Vespasian, you shall become Caesar, you and your son. Vespasian was skeptical and suspected he was lying to save his life, but he changed his mind when he discovered that Josephus had also prophesied that Yotvat would fall in exactly 47 days, which it had done. Um, and after the prophecy, his life was spared and he lived a comfortable life as part of Vespasian's entourage, but remained a prisoner. This is all very odd, by the way. This is as it's described in the book, Josephus' book. This is what happens. Whether Josephus was always a spy for the Romans, as some people have later claimed, we just don't know. Anyway, he stays with Vespasian, and two years later, on the 1st of July, 69, Vespasian does become emperor. Josephus' prophecy had been fulfilled. Vespasian is impressed. So his chains were ceremoniously shattered with an axe, symbolizing that his imprisonment had never officially happened. And after this, Josephus becomes a trusted advisor, intelligence officer, and translator to Vespasian's son, Titus, who is going to go on and uh, conduct the siege of Jerusalem. Josephus actively helps Titus. He, he helps him pinpoint the most vulnerable spot in the city walls in which to make a breach. And when people escape from the city because he speaks Hebrew and Aramaic, he interrogates them and passes on useful information to Titus. Titus tried to get him to persuade the defenders to surrender. And so he attempts to negotiate with the Jews in Jerusalem. But he was a defector. He was treated with contempt. The Jews saw him as a self-serving coward and traitor. Whereas he describes himself as a prophet who was trying to save the temple from ruthless and egotistical extremists. But he was met with jeers and insults. There are other rabbis, by the way, doing this. So Hillel is also arguing that it's wrong to fight the Romans. He's not on his own in this regard. At one point, a stone thrown from the walls knocks him unconscious and the defenders rush out to finish him off, but Roman soldiers rescue him just in time. The city finally fell on Tisha B'Av in the year 70. Many people were killed. The temple was destroyed, as you know, and Josephus witnesses Titus's triumphant legions leading off the Jewish captives and carrying away the temple treasures. The Arch of Titus in Rome, which still exists today, depicts the legionnaires carrying the temple's treasures, including the menorah, uh, in his triumphal procession in Rome. Titus permitted Josephus to remove whatever he wanted from the ruins of, Je of Jerusalem, and he tells us that he took a safer Torah. After this, he becomes a Roman citizen. He was given some land and a pension, and he took the emperor's family name, Flavius. And then age 33, he, he lives in Rome, in Vespasian's old house. And although he's favored by the emperors, many Romans thought he was a spy and he would have been killed if it hadn't been under their protection. He lived a lonely life there whilst writing. He had no friends amongst the ruling class. So he wrote all his works whilst living in Rome. He recorded Jewish history with special emphasis on the first century and the Jewish Roman war, which he experienced firsthand. Now all his books are highly selective and polemical. They flattered Vespasian, they were extravagantly obsequious, and they were sycophantic towards Titus. His most important works were firstly the Jewish War, which he wrote in about 75, and this was written in Aramaic, translated into Greek. 
written at the request of Titus and try to, to persuade Jews to not blame Romans for the destruction of the Jewish state and the temple. It was designed to keep peace in the diaspora. The second book written in about 94 was called Antiquities of the Jews. And this is a summary of Jewish history, summarizing the biblical narrative, drawing on various works which are now lost to us for the post-biblical period. Its aim was to educate non-Jews about Judaism and to counter the charge that the Jews were not an ancient people. So one book is sort of against Jews and one book is for Jews. And his writings provide the source for many stories considered to be biblical history, despite these not being found in the Bible. So these include Ishmael being the founder of the Arabs and the story of the siege of Masada, neither of which he had first-hand knowledge of. His writings include unique material on individuals and customs and places. So, for example, they're the most significant account of the period of the Maccabees and the Hasmoneans. He describes the rise of Herod, the Sadducees, the high priests, the Pharisees, the temple, all the information about zealots and figures such as Pontius Pilate, Agrippa, John the Baptist, James, the brother of Jesus. All this information comes from Herod and not many other sources. In terms of his personal life, his first wife died during the siege of Jerusalem. Vespasian arranged for him to marry a captured Jewish woman who left him. Um, in about 71, he married an Alexandrian Jewish woman and, who, and he had three sons with her, of whom only one survived. Josephus later divorced her and in around 75, he married his fourth wife, who was an aristocratic Greek Jewish woman from Crete. And they seemed to be happy. They had two sons. Titus died in 81. He was succeeded by his brother Domitian, who continued to protect Joseph from attack, but didn't really take an interest in his work. Josephus dies sometime between 95 and 100. OK, so that's all we know about his life. Let's have a look about his works. And obviously the most important work is this one called the Jewish War, which is our prime source of the Roman revolt and the fall, sorry, the revolt against the Romans and the fall of Jerusalem. It's written in seven volumes um, and it starts with the period of the Maccabees and concludes at the fall of Masada, as I'll explain. Um, in the preface, Josephus criticised historians who misrepresented the events of the war. We've lost their works now, but he says that uh, his, work, his methods are also not objective. This is a quote. I shall add my own interpretations of the events to the narratives, allowing room for my personal feelings and bewailing my country's tragedy. So he's being quite open, he's not being objective, and we need to find our way through this. Josephus is clear that he loathed the Jewish rebel factions and was outraged by their atrocities. He calls these people zealots. And in his view, these zealots harmed Jerusalem far more than the Romans did. Initially, they had widespread popular support and the peace party was in the majority. But this changed as more and more extremists uh, gathered and they were enforcing compliance to their policies. It's strangely reminiscent with how nationalism is, is increasing today. He used these zealots as scapegoats to absolve Jews from as much blame as possible and to protect the lives of the Jews at the in the time he was writing. So he was part of the establishment, basically, and he couldn't relate to the oppressed and dispossessed lower classes. He didn't understand their economic grievances. 40,000 of them had just been made unemployed because the temple had been finished just a couple of years earlier, and there was mass poverty. 
They wanted a more egalitarian society and they weren't getting it. The rulers, the ruling priestly caste were, were oppressing the working class, you could say. So in his books, he never did justice to the rebels' genuine belief in their cause. Um, and his work is clearly a book of propaganda. Um, this is a quote. I shall describe the cruelty of the Jewish tyrants to their fellow countrymen in contrast to the clemency of the Romans towards a race of foreigners. And how often Titus showed his eagerness to save the city and the temple by inviting the rebels to make terms. Probably not the case at all. The Romans never really did this elsewhere, so why should they do it here? He loyally claimed that Titus had never intended to destroy or loot the temple. And this was contradicted by later Roman historians, such as Tacitus and Severus. He thought, Josephus thought, that Judea and Rome could have existed amicably, but a rift had been opened up by the corrupt governors. This was widened by reckless criminal acts by some extremist Jews, uh, who contrasted sharply with the normal Jew, who was a loyal and peace-loving citizen. So the war was foisted upon the Jewish people by factional extremists from a messianic sect. They manipulated the people away from traditional aristocratic leaders like himself with disastrous results. And this was made possible by the failure of the established ruling class to lead effectively. He described himself as a brave general, a shrewd statesman and a benevolent governor. He whitewashed his own actions. He ignored his own failures and he basically lied about himself. So he always portrays the Roman method of warfare as pure and fair whilst Jewish bandits were responsible for their own destruction. The rebels were brutal tyrants and the Romans practiced clemency. According to Josephus, the ultimate cause of Jerusalem's defeat was starvation, not Rome. John of Giscala, who we met earlier in the story and who Josephus describes as a, as a dictator, he lost all restraint he deliberately burned the city's corn stores, which led to desperate, inhuman behaviour. Josephus recorded a notorious incident where a woman called Mary murdered her own baby boy, who she was suckling at the time, then roasted and ate him. Uh, this is extreme, obviously, but the Talmud itself says that the, the Second Temple fell because of baseless hatred, really, which there clearly was a civil war going on. Josephus himself takes a traditional theological Jewish view. The destruction of the temple was God's punishment for sins done by Jews. Um, and the rabbis of the Talmud agreed. The Romans were merely tools used by God to achieve divine justice. The book itself was reprinted in, a, in an error-strewn version in the Middle Ages, and this misidentified the author as another Josephus who was involved at the time, a guy called Joseph Ben Gorion, G O R I O N, who was a rebel leader. Um, despite this, these errors, it became the most important Hebrew historical book of the Middle Ages and was widely read both by Muslims and Ethiopian Christians. After the first generation of readers, Jews ignored the books for centuries. It was banned as Josephus was seen as a traitor. And his critics felt he should have committed suicide in Galilee. Um, and that by accepting the patronage of Rome, his testimony was fatally compromised. The book inspired the best-selling novel, Ben-Hur, and the later play and Hollywood film. It also inspired Israel's first prime minister, David Grun, to change his name to David Ben-Gurion after the rebel leader and supposed author. And the Jewish war has subsequently served as a touchstone in debates about practically every aspect of the modern Jewish experience. He's been praised as a hero and also uh, criticized as a traitor and collaborator. 
The Holocaust generated empathy for Josephus as a witness to a national tragedy. And that came to a fore, particularly in Masada, which is the culmination of his book. And um, as I mentioned, Josephus is the only historical source we have for the siege of Masada. And his story is that in 72, the Roman gov uh, governor with 15,000 soldiers surrounded about a thousand zealots who had been holed up on Masada for three years. They built a siege ramp, which is still there, against the western face of the plateau. And this involved moving thousands of tons of stones. In a giant siege tower with a battering ram was moved up to the ramp and when they, uh, and the Romans assaulted the wall. Now I've got a clip to show you what actually went on. So I'm going to share my screen with you and hopefully get the best, the appropriate uh, screen up. Okay, so Stuart, is that okay? Can you see that? I can see, yes, I've got a thumbs up. Perfect, okay. Yeah, yeah. So this is a video clip which explains what went on in the siege of Masada, which I thought would be quite interesting. Masada lies 2.4 kilometers from the Dead Sea on a barren, flat-top limestone mountain amidst a desolate landscape. On its eastern side, the summit rises 140 meters above the desert floor, roughly half the height of the Eiffel Tower. Here, a tortuous, zigzagging trail known as the Serpent Path makes its way to the top. By comparison, the western approach is more assailable, and yet even this side towers 80 meters above the surrounding landscape, the approximate height of the Statue of Liberty. As if natural defenses weren't enough, the cleared plateau at the top was ringed with a 1400 meter long casemate wall standing 6 meters tall. The wall design was such that it was actually made of two parallel layers with a central gap that could be filled with stones or dirt during a siege. Such walls were common in antiquity as they were cheaper and faster to construct while also doubling as storage space. In the case of Masada, the outer wall was 1.4 meters thick and the inner was 1 meter, making for a combined width of 4 meters. The walls were reinforced by 30 towers, spaced out for topographic and strategic reasons. These were generally 6 meters wide and 20 meters tall with stairs leading to the top. The entire defensive structure could only be crossed at four points. The Snake Path Gate, the Water Gate, the Western Gate, and the Cistern Gate. As with all impregnable fortresses, the Achilles heel of any defense would be access to food and water for the defenders. However, Masada was well prepared in this respect. Cut into the rock were numerous cisterns and reservoirs. Twelve were constructed in two rows along the northwestern slopes with a total capacity of 40,000 cubic meters or 16 Olympic pools. Buildings also dotted the top of the plateau with a series of long storehouses built into the northern complex. These could hold large quantities of corn, oil, wine, dates, and food supplies that would be preserved for long periods of time due to the naturally dry climate. Even if stockpiles began to run low, the open plateau area might be used to grow additional food. It's safe to say that a defensive force could expect to hold out indefinitely against just about any attacker. Unfortunately for the Jews, the Roman army wasn't your average foe. In fact, the Roman force bearing down on Masada had at its core the 10th Fratensis Legion, this unit of 4,800 men was a descendant of Julius Caesar's famed 10th Legion and was adorned with numerous battle honors. Recently, it had been blooded by campaigns in Armenia and was battle-hardened by the Siege of Jerusalem. This grizzled legion was joined by six auxiliary cohorts and thousands of Jewish prisoners of war. In total, Silva arrived at Masada with a force of nearly 10,000. Bunkered atop the fortress, looking down on the incoming troops, would be a defensive garrison of less than 1,000. Even this number is inflated since a large part of Masada's occupants were actually refugees. These women and children were certainly not dead weight, and could have helped with defensive operations under the guidance of the Jewish commander Eleazar ben Yair. 
Eleazar was an important figure in the Jewish revolt and was one of the principal leaders of the Sicarii, who now made up the main fighting force at Masada. These troops were a splinter group of the Hebrew zealots and whose name means literally dagger men. They were fierce resistance forces, made famous for being one of the earliest organized assassination units that would strike their targets in public gatherings before disappearing into the crowd. Such zealots had successfully held the Romans at bay and even defeated them in the past despite being poorly equipped and were not to be underestimated. When the Romans arrived in the autumn of 73 AD, they had no illusions that the siege would be over quickly. With this understanding, they set up camp on the western approach and went about securing their own position whilst undermining the defenders. First, the Romans targeted the aqueducts serving the fortress and diverted them for their own use. Next, they set to work constructing a wall of circumvallation. This was a textbook, Roman operation meant to encircle enemy positions. The fortification would ensure that defenders were cut off from the outside world and help thwart attempts at a breakout. During the siege of Jerusalem, Titus had failed to construct such a wall from the get-go and was harassed mercilessly by Jewish sorties. Silva was determined not to make the same mistake and put his men to work immediately. Using pickaxes and entrenching tools, the Romans quarried local stones and erected a 3 meter wall which ran 3.2 kilometers. This was reinforced by 8 camps and numerous guard posts. In addition, a string of towers helped shore up defenses on the more exposed eastern valley. This impressive network was built in a matter of days and can be clearly seen in the desert today. Silva established his headquarters on the higher ground to the west, along with legionary cohorts 1 through 5, while cohorts 6 through 10 took residence on the low ground to the east. The remainder of the auxiliary forces were then stationed in the surrounding minor camps, thus ensuring that troops completely surrounded the fortress. Now that the attackers had their prey cornered, it was time to close in for the kill. The Romans decided that taking the fortress by force would be necessary, since their own supplies would run out long before those of the defenders. But the question still remained of how best to assault a mountaintop. A quick storming of the walls with ladders was out of the question since any attack would be forced to advance at a dangerously slow pace and would be funneled through narrow killing fields. In this scenario, the defenders would be at a huge advantage and any outcome would be Pyrrhic at best. Typically, Roman forces would overcome such adversity by using siege equipment to offer protection from projectiles whilst artillery suppressed the defenders. However, the terrain at Masada was far too steep for siege equipment and too high for artillery. It would therefore be necessary to not only overcome the defenders, but nature itself. Ultimately, the Romans decided to turn the rocky cliffside into a gradual highway for an assault. To do this, the engineers would build an enormous siege ramp by taking advantage of a natural spur called the White Rock on the western side of the mountain. The plan was to bridge the existing gulf up to the walls with the man-made 20 degree incline. To support a ramp of this scale, the base had to be huge, so as not to collapse under its own weight, and was started roughly 200 meters out from the cliff. Here, the 10th Fratensis took the lead in construction while Jewish prisoners were used to bring a continual stream of water and supplies to the camps. Day in and day out, they slowly added more and more material to the foundation. At first the volume being added would do little to increase the height of the ramp, but as the days, weeks, and months rolled by, it only grew faster and faster. The sheer audacity of the construction project must have awed the defenders, who woke up every morning to a mountain slowly rising towards their walls. However, as the ramp got closer and closer, it meant that workers were more and more vulnerable to projectiles launched from the walls and towers above. In response, the Romans surely would have begun to erect temporary walls and sheds to cover their progress. Additional archers and artillery may also have been called up to provide covering fire for the work crews and to dissuade counterattacks. Within two months, the ramp to the fortress was complete. It measured 220 meters wide at its base, rose 90 meters, and was topped with a 20 meter stone pier nearest the wall. 
According to archaeologists, this obscenely large amount of earthwork weighed the equivalent of one and a half times the Empire State Building. It is stunning to imagine that this was accomplished without the use of modern equipment. Now, a 25 meter siege tower was constructed and slowly rolled up the ramp. It was specifically designed to handle the angled slope and included a battering ram at the front. The tower likely also carried small artillery pieces which could be used to shoot down at the enemy walls which it now overlooked. It is important to note that this was often the primary purpose of siege towers. Rather than being glorified elevators for infantry assaults, they were actually meant to provide elevated positions for sniping at defenders and forcing them away from the walls while a larger breach was formed. In the case of Masada, the siege tower guarded the battering ram, which started to break down the walls. In response, the defenders set about reinforcing their defenses. When the Roman ram broke through the main wall, the attackers were faced with a second, hastily erected wall made of alternating layers of wood and earth. This wall proved far more resilient to the battering ram, seemingly absorbing every blow. It was however flammable, and so the Romans set fire to the timbers. Though the flames caught on, the wind changed direction and blew the flames back onto the siege tower, setting it alight. The attackers now faced the devastating prospect of having their equipment destroyed without having set foot within the fortress. Fortunes once again shifted, however, and the wind reversed direction, concentrating the fire back onto the inner wall. By nightfall, the defenses were sufficiently weakened, and the legionaries made preparations for a full force assault the next day. As the sun rose over Masada on the 3rd of May, the 10th Fratensis Legion stormed through the wall and burst out onto the plateau. Rather than being met by screams and shouts, however, they faced a deafening silence. The complex was filled with bodies of dead Jews. According to the historian Josephus, the defenders had accepted the inevitability of their fate and chosen death rather than capture. The grisly details of this mass suicide were apparently recounted by the handful of women and children who evaded the slaughter. More recent historical findings, however, have found discrepancies with Josephus' story and cast doubt on the final fate of the defenders. Nonetheless, the symbolism of a heroic Jewish last stand against oppressors lives on to this day and is a point of pride for the Israeli Defense Force recruits who take a vow never to let Masada fall again. Okay, so that's the story of uh, Masada. When, in fact, Joseph, when the Romans get up there, Josephus says that there were two women and three children left over, and he happens to interview one of the women who happens to remember the final speech given by Eliezer ben Yair. Masada lies to, oops, Let me just uh, move on to the next bit, next slide. Um, who remembers Masada, this, uh, this um, speech, and here it is here. So this speech is, since we long ago resolved never to be servants to the Romans, nor to any other than to God himself, who alone is the true and just Lord of mankind, the time has now come that obliges us to make that resolution true in practice. We were the very first that revolted and we are the last that fights. I cannot but esteem it as a favor that God has granted us, that it is still in our power to die bravely and in a state of freedom, which has not been the case of others who were conquered unexpectedly. It is very plain that we shall be taken within a day's time, but it is still an eligible thing to die after a glorious manner together with our dearest friends. Let our wives die before they are abused and our children before they have tasted of slavery. And after we have slain them, let us bestow that glorious benefit upon one another mutually and preserve ourselves in freedom as an excellent funeral monument, monument for us. So that is apparently the last speech and then they all committed um, suicide. Um, in fact, they didn't commit suicide because as Judaism prohibits suicide, 
Uh, Josepha said that the defenders drew lots and they killed each other in turn down to the last person who was the only one to actually take his own life. Now, you might recall various similarities between the story of Yotvat, which I talked before, and it seems arguable that Josephus, well, he almost certainly invented this speech, and he based it upon the previous description of himself at Yotvat. It's much more virtuous and maybe represents what he would have liked to have said, but didn't. Eliezer ben Yair had the courage to kill himself, but Josephus did not. Oddly, by eulogizing the fate of the last of the rebels of Masada, he paradoxically made a hero of one of his hated zealots. Josephus's story can be read in a negative way, as a case of Jewish radicals refusing to compromise, resorting instead to suicide and the murder of their families. The discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947 and the excavation of Masada in the 1960s brought Josephus into na Israeli national consciousness. Um, as was mentioned in the film, the IDF recruits are still sworn in at Masada and the motto of the Israeli army is Masada shall not fall again. So that was one of his books. He also wrote another book called Antiquities of the Jews. This is a 21 volume uh, book and it recounts the history of the world from a Jewish perspective, written for Greek and Roman readers. The only existing accounts of Judaism were very unsympathetic. So he defended Judaism and showed that Jews had traditionally been allowed to practice unmolested. They were exempt from public requirements that contradicted the religion. So he outlined Jewish history from creation. Uh, sometimes he framed the story to be acceptable to his audience. So for example, Abraham actually taught science to the Egyptians, which might come as a surprise to some of us. And it was the Egyptians who taught it to Greeks, but Abraham was the originator of science. Moses, according to Josephus, set up a senatorial priestly aristocracy which like that of Rome resisted monarchy. So the great figures of Torah were presented as ideal philosophic philosopher leaders. He omitted the story of the golden calf as he was concerned that this could be used by anti-Jewish uh, Alexandrians to support the allegation that the Jews worshiped an ass's head in the temple. He ignored the prophets too. Um, he embellished biblical narratives. He stressed the rationality of Jewish laws. Um, and so he stripped Judaism of all its mysticism and passion. He was trying to make it appeal to cultivated and reasonable thinkers. The book was poorly received. And so he wrote a more robust defense of Judaism when he called this against Appian. Appian was a, a Greek anti-Semite who'd written an anti-Jewish book. So Josephus stressed the superiority of Judaism over paganism in this book. Um, he addressed anti-Jewish allegations um, and he said that the Jewish people were unique because of their constitution. And this he called theocracy. So what by which he meant that all sovereignty and authority was given to God. And he was the very first person to use this term. He contrasted the universalism of Jews, so its idea of one transcendent God, with the particularism of Greek ideas. So Judaism is open to all. Anyone can become a Jew who accepts its principles. But the Greek city-state did not accept everyone as citizens. Um, it, was, it, it was exclusive. For Josephus, halakha provided the moral training through education and practice, so everyone knew how to live virtuously. Although obedience to the Jewish law was voluntary, it instilled fortitude and bravery and self-sacrifice. He claimed that Jews were unique 
as in the last resort, they were prepared to die for their laws. And for him, the key ethics of Judaism were industriousness, sobriety, trust, sharing with the needy and strong family ties. So here's a quote I've got. Let me just um, share the screen again and show you this quote from it, which I think is really interesting. OK, so Jews have introduced to the rest of the world a very large number of very beautiful ideas. What greater beauty than inviolable piety? What higher justice than obedience to the law? What more beneficial than to be in harmony with another, to be a prey neither to disunion in adversity nor to arrogance and faction in prosperity? In war, to despise death in peace, to devote oneself to crafts and agriculture, and to be convinced that everything in the whole universe is under the eye and direction of God. So you can see he's really defending Judaism strongly at this point, um, unlike previously. Okay, so let me um, stop sharing. Okay, so robustly defending Judaism in a hostile Rome was a brave thing to do, and this redeemed his reputation for some Jews. He did care about the good name of Judaism, but he didn't succeed in softening Roman attitudes to the Jews. So let me summarize his life for you. He was a first century priest, a politician, a soldier, a writer, the first Jewish historian. So his works are the main source outside the Bible on the history of Judea. And his writing style, as you maybe got a flavor, is epic and emotional. He captured the horrors and chaos of the brutal events surrounding the destruction of the temple. He was an observant Pharisee, but religiously moderate. He believed cooperation was possible between the Jewish and Gentile worlds. And for him, the future of the Jewish people depended on submission to Rome. He was vehemently critical of the Jewish rebels, deploring their extremism. To be a true Jew and to do God's will was to resist zealotry. His life embodied the conflicts of the first century Jew. The tensions between local patriotism and loyalty to Rome, between native culture and the Roman civilization, between pragmatic flexibility and rigid sectarianism. And he stood out in his capacity to survive and thrive amongst these conflicting forces. Jews despised him as a traitor who deserted his people in their time of need defected to the hated enemy and acted as a Roman apologist, spreading false news. Whilst Christians saw him as the key witness to the punishment of the Jews, as shown through that Jewish defeat by the Romans, so for them he became a widely read author. The real Josephus, well, he's an enigma. We know nothing of him outside his own writings, which were not factual histories. He was sophisticated, well-educated, ingenious, quick-thinking, persuasive, but he was also self-serving and vain and unscrupulous and snobbish, unlucky actually. He wrote with this indomitable sense of purpose and was convinced in the justness of his own position. He saw himself as a prophet who saved his life in order to devote himself to the higher interests of his people. And that's it, and I'd be interested to see what you think. Is he a goodie or is he a baddie? Gosh, Jonathan, I, I can't make my mind up on that. I, I veered between thinking what a great supporter of the Jews he was to somebody who undermined our history, but what a wonderful history lesson you've given us for almost the last hour. And, you know, you bring it up to date, or when I say up to date, mentions of Ben Herb. Ben-Gurion, but I did like that final quote from him that you gave just in that last slide. So, gosh, uh, people can make their own minds up, as you rightly said in, in the introduction to this, but uh, he was quite a survivor in the end, wasn't he, in terms of his own? Absolutely. That's what makes yeah. him stand out, yeah. Okay, any questions for Jonathan on that, or are you 
sort of still taking in all that information and detail. I, I'm certainly uh, overawed by it. It's Rita, Rita speaking. Go on, Rita. Go on, Rita. Yeah, thank you very much for your interesting talk. What did the historians think about all the, these books? Oh, uh, pretty much the story that I've given. So I've, I've taken the modern view of him um, that um, modern history, over the centuries, Jewish, uh, Judaism has really castigated him, whereas Christianity has applauded him. And I think today there's a more balanced view about it. Um, to be fair, that's how histories were written by the Romans. None of them were objective. They were all were putting across a view. But it's clear he was paid by the Roman emperors to say what he wanted to. Um, if he hadn't written the, the, the last book I described about the antiquities of the Jews, I think they would have really not paid too much attention to him. But he clearly stood out and did something very brave in doing this. So mixed and a mystery, really, is, is, yes. the, is the view of him. Yeah. And we've learned a lot about Masada, of course, at a um, wonderful history lesson from you, Jonathan. Yeah. Anything else? Any more questions for Jonathan? Or is it so much information given to you there? You need to start thinking about it. Ronnie? You're on silent, Ronnie. You're on mute. Yeah, um so many of the things you, you've outlined uh, have similarities with the present goings on in Israel and the politicians. It's incredible how history continually re repeats itself. I, I mean, thank you for bringing that up. Absolutely, that's what occurred to me when I was researching it. Not just this time, but any time in Jewish history, not just Jewish history, but particularly when we get extreme, it doesn't work out. It's, uh, as Maimonides said, my, moderation in all things is the way. And uh, these extreme factions, it's, it's ending, it, it does, yeah, it's a problem. So thank you for that, Ronnie, it's absolutely right. Okay, um, unless there's any, anybody else? No? Okay, Jonathan, thank you so much once again. As always, you've given us uh, plenty of food for thought, some lessons and some history lessons and, uh, I leave everybody to make their own individual minds up on the question you propose. So thank you so much. Um, thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you. Good. Jonathan, it's Daphne here. As always, wonderful, fascinating talk. I thoroughly enjoy it. Very, very interesting. And thank you, as always, for agreeing to talk to us. We enjoy all your talks and we'll look forward to the next time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. OK, just to finish off today, just to remind you on Thursday is Current Affairs. Malcolm Blayberg uh, is your host for that at two o'clock. Uh, and next Tuesday, we have a very interesting session, uh, for, particularly for those of us that live in Bushy. Many of you will remember Sue Gill, who gave us a talk a few months ago on a walk around Hampstead. And we learned a lot about Hampstead that perhaps we didn't know before. And it looks like we're going to learn a lot about Bushy that we didn't know before. Uh, she says she's going to come up with some facts that will both surprise us and astound us. So that we have to look forward to next Tuesday with Sue Gill. Meanwhile, enjoy the sunshine, keep safe, keep well, take care of yourselves and thanks for joining us today.